Tooth Cree, A4NA, Charvis Plus, um, and of course the CFS HLPE for, for hosting this event. It's a real pleasure to be able to present the findings to all of you. And just, you know, Eileen is, is really important because she was considered the convener of the group. She sits on this high level panel, but we always have a convener to help the team. And she became a real therapist for us. Uh, so it, it was an important uh, role that she, she served. So it's my pleasure to present the report. Um, there's, there's room up here if people want to sit, but you may not be able to see the slides. Um, someone uh, told me that it looks like Candy Crush, <laughs> the cover. <laughs> I won't state my opinion about the cover, but um, that's uh, obviously an ironic title. Um, so why this report and why now? Well, one in three people in the world suffer from malnutrition. And if you just look at these statistics, it's really quite staggering. I know you've all seen these statistics before, but really look at them. I mean, it's a massive burden. You know, while global health statistics are improving, like child mortality is going down, really malnutrition is not. We're seeing more and more obese uh, adults and children in the world. Stunting is coming down in some places, not others, and it's coming down too slowly. We still have high burdens of wasting, which really puts children at risk for <coughs> mortality. And now we've got four declared famines in four countries in the world, and some places suffering from uh, penetrating droughts that are really uh, uh, putting uh, some smallholder farmers, pastoralists, and fisher folk really on their knees. So we really have a huge burden to deal with. And food systems are really important. Now I know this slide is very scary, but in the report we try to bring together the importance of food systems for nutrition and health outcomes. And this was the framework that we used. And just briefly, we walk through key elements. We talk about the food supply chain, how food moves through a system from production to consumption. Once food moves and hits a market, it enters what we call the food environment the place where consumers engage with the food system. They have to make a choice, right? And they bring their personal preferences and influences to that food environment. But the food environment itself is very influential. How far are you from the market? What's the cost of that food? Are you willing to pay for that food? Is it advertised? Where is it in the store? Where is it placed? Is it the candy bars in the front by the cash register? Is it in the back of the store? All of these triggers can influence decision making and how consumers behave and how they acquire, consume, cook, purchase food. And this of course has influences on health and nutrition outcomes, which also have influences on social, economic, and environment. On the top we have these drivers. There's so many drivers that are triggering the food system, either positively or negatively that are exogenous to the food system or endogenous. We can think of some of the big ones. Climate change, natural resource degradation, technology, urbanization, population pressure. There's lots of drivers that are, are shaping food systems. And in the report we go into um, three different types of food systems that have different impacts on, on health and diets and we talk about traditional food systems these are more informal systems often found in rural places or sometimes uh, uh, urban areas where it's you have a more informal built environment mixed food systems a combination of informal and formal systems supermarkets to corner stores to regional wet markets and then modern food systems, I guess we could call DC a very modern food system. Lots of hypermarkets, supermarkets, um, lots of places to acquire food, upscale restaurants, food trucks, what have you. And when we look at this, we can look at how different types of food systems influence malnutrition burdens. And we look at a whole range of countries across a wide set of indicators that characterize food systems. We basically show that in traditional systems, we're still dealing with high burdens of undernutrition, whereas in mixed food systems or modern food systems, we're dealing more with obesity issues. And we should take into account that there's a lot of intra-country diversity in food systems. 
And there's tons of micro food environments that consumers engage with. But just looking at global statistics, national level data, there's patterns that emerge depending on what types of food systems countries uh, have. So why do we care about food systems? Well, diets are really the central piece. Food systems feed our dietary patterns. And they're changing rapidly in recent decades. <laughs> as people get wealthier, as we have globalization, urbanization, people's preferences are changing. They get access to more diverse foods. The food types of foods are changing. And more and more people are exposed to new food environments expanding their food choices and diversifying their dietary patterns both in positive ways and negative ways. It's not all a bad picture of sugar, fat, and salt in processed, ultra-packaged foods, right? It's not all a, a, a bad story when we look at, at countries. And we talk about that a lot in the report. But what we do know is that unhealthy diets are now one of the top risk factors of morbidity and mortality. Chris Murray's team at University of Washington, global burden of disease is showing that. The second <laughs> analysis around that diets, those unhealthy diets, high in processed meats, high in fats, sugar, overly highly processed foods, are not good for us. Um, and these, of course, also have an impact on the planet, our natural resources and the ecosystems that we need to supply our food system. And we also know that countries are transitioning, food systems are changing. As we urbanize, traditional food systems give way to more of these mixed systems and transitioning economies towards modern food systems. And the epidemiology of global health burden is shifting. We're moving away from the undernutrition more to the overweight and obesity and non-communicable diseases. Now that is the biggest issue we have on our plate. So we go into, and I, of course I don't have time, I only have 12 minutes, lots of examples of how we can improve food systems for better diets and nutrition. We talk a lot about policies and programs <coughs> of how you can ensure that nutrition enters the value chain as food moves along the system. And we provide lots of evidence of what has worked. Also, lots of evidence emerging, mainly in high income countries, of how to improve food environments. We need to understand more about improving food environments in low and middle income contexts. We also know what doesn't work and what causes harm um, a, across the value chain as well as food environments. So we talk a lot about some of the challenges that value chains face and some of the perverse incentives happening in the food environment and, and some of the negative consequences of those policies. Um, including subsidies, taxes, trade, etc. Uh, advertising and marketing to children, poor labeling practices, etc. So one thing that we focus on a lot are um, how do we create an enabling environment? And this is really the, the really challenging part of how do we make food systems healthier. We need to build a supportive political environment through better multi-sectoral coordination. We need to understand what actors are doing in the food system. Everyone needs to be held accountable and be effective. We need to invest in nutrition and food systems. 1% of overseas development assistance goes towards nutrition. That's basically a rounding error in overseas development assistance. So that's a, and we're dealing with a massive burden, so there's a real inequity. Human capacity is a serious limiting factor to scaling up evidence, coverage, impact, and sustainability of nutrition programs. Um, and there's lots of examples in the report about executive training, technology-driven platforms for frontline workers, and south-to-south -south university consortiums. Social movements, media, coalitions, and networks are really important. They're important for any kind of major societal transformation, and they, hit, they help create the necessary institutional and system <coughs> capacity. And we need to successfully combat the multiple burdens of malnutrition, but these are going to depend on the many stakeholders that engage in food systems, not just public sector, but private sector and civil society. But there's barriers and obstacles, and I hope we can talk about these today. Um, we're dealing a lot with the failure to recognize the right to adequate food. 
Um, action requires recognizing that right, and states have an obligation to ensure that policies and processes respect, promote, and protect the right to food. Imbalance of power across the food system. Power struggles are presenting challenges, and this is one of the biggest issues. We need more balance of power across the food system, and there's a clear tension and lack of trust with transnational food uh, companies. Instead of working against each other, we absolutely have to find a way to work together moving forward. And it's holding people accountable and figuring out a just path forward collectively. And we need more of a concerted effort to address conflicts of interest, declaring interests, recognizing when it's a conflict that hamper progress towards better food security and nutrition. Transparency and disclosure is absolutely key. So what's the motivation to act? Well, the scale of the burden raises alarms. I hope it raises alarms for, for all of you. We need to act very swiftly. The societal costs of an unhealthy diet and the health outcomes associated with those are, are really significant, particularly for the most vulnerable. But it is the most powerful that need to act. Food systems face enormous challenges, but there's also so many opportunities to make change. And if current trends continue, the costs generated by the current collective mismanagement of the world's natural resources and food systems will rise. And that was written by uh, one of my teammates, Lawrence Haddad, and I completely agree with him on that. So what are we left with? Well, there's solutions and evidence to act. But action cannot wait. We need disruptive change. Leadership absolutely must come from governments, and governments must engage their development partners in a coordinated way. And we have to seize the moment to make the UN Decade of Action of Nutrition an impactful one and make the SDGs count. We've got 12 years left already with the SDGs. We're three years in. It's pretty scary. So let's make the SDGs better than the MDGs, and let's ensure that we don't have to have another decade of action for nutrition. Let's make this the only one. We recommend um, lots of, of, of recommendations in the report. We have some high-level ones for the CFS. We have some very specific ones for different stakeholders across food supplies, food environments, and around consumer behavior. We call out specific actors that have to do their part on that. And so I encourage you all to look at those set of recommendations. And I would just like to thank the hosts for having me present. It's, it's a real pleasure. This was a grueling process, as Eileen said, but I hope you garner some bits of, of uh, relevance from the report as you read it. Thank you so much. <laughs>